We're going to start a new new unit today on linear models. We'll be talking about this for a few weeks. Um, in fact, we'll be talking one way or another. We'll be talking about this for quite a while. Um, today, the goal is just to talk about. Uh, I want to introduce you to this idea of a linear model. Before we move into linear models, I want to just take a step back and see where we are in the bigger picture. Um, we are talking about supervised learning. And uh, the first week of the class, we talked about instances and concepts and hypotheses. Instances are things that get that are inputs to your classifiers. Concepts are the functions we want to learn. And hypotheses are the functions that we do learn. And hypothesis space is a set of functions we explore. Um, a learning algorithm is basically just this function that takes labeled data in and uh, produces a hypothesis or a model. I'm using the letter H for that. And the hypothesis itself is a function, the function that takes a new example, possibly unseen example, and gives you a prediction. In particular, we have seen one class of learning algorithms that produces decision trees, and that's the ID3 algorithm. Along the way, we have also encountered, whether you like it or not, we've encountered a couple of more general machine learning ideas. One of them is uh, the idea that you can use features uh, uh, as high dimensional vectors. And that's something that we will kind of go deeper into going ahead. The other one, which we just discussed, is uh, the idea of overfitting. Any questions about where we are in the class before we uh, talk about linear models? In the next maybe about 20 minutes, I want to tell you about what linear models are. And in the next, on Thursday, I'll start off by talking about what kinds of functions linear classifiers express. So um, let's uh, uh, dive in. So I'll first talk about linear classifiers and linear regressors, what they are, you know, mathematically what they are. And uh, the nice thing about these kinds of models is that you can actually think there's a nice geometric interpretation to them. So we'll, uh, I, I'll try to kind of give you a mental model to think about the geometry of linear models. And uh, after that, I'll spend a little bit of time um, kind of painfully simplifying some notation. Uh, it may seem tedious, but it will save some time later on. And finally, I'll talk about why I'm talking about linear classifiers. So uh, a few lectures back, I talked about, uh, I showed the slide and said, maybe learning is not possible at all because we cannot know what uh, goes in these question marks without seeing all the data. And how could we possibly learn anything? And the answer to this question was, the only way we can learn something is if we make some assumptions. So, if we do not search over every possible function and instead we restrict our search space and restrict ourselves to certain classes of functions. Um, instead of looking at all possible Boolean functions, we have to somehow either explicitly or implicitly like the ID3 algorithm does, restrict our search space. So uh, we saw some examples uh, with simple conjunctions and so on. One such class of function where we restrict our search space uh, are linear functions. They are a certain hypothesis space that are really well studied in the literature for a few reasons. A, they are simple. B, they tend to have nice mathematical properties from an optimization perspective, which we'll get to eventually. And they're also interpretable. And sometimes it turns out that uh, they are very, very expressive. They are this sort of a flexible class of models that can be used as a the first thing to try when you see some data set. Uh, just uh, let's try to build up some intuition. Imagine that you have some data like this of uh, points here. Some points are circles and some points are triangles. And our goal is to separate the circles from the triangle. And I have two different functions. One function is this curve, and the other one is this dotted line. Any thoughts on? The question for you is, which one do you prefer? By the way, the way this, the way to interpret this is, this uh, partitions the space in space. One side is blue, the other side is red. 
One side is a triangle, the other side is a circle. So the question for you is, uh, which of these would you prefer? Yeah. Do you care about 100% training accuracy though? And why is that? Well, easier to implement is never the answer. <laughs> no, it is, but it's sometimes the answer, but not this time. Yes. And why might that be? That's right. So the answer was um, the linear uh, separator here, line B, might be better because the curve might end up fitting noise in the data. As an example, consider this point here. Maybe that was noisy. Or maybe um, this point here was noisy. Or maybe this point here is noisy. Or let's say that I add another point. Let's say that I add another point, say, here, and make it a triangle. Now, in order to fit that, you have to do some complicated. Let me see if I can do this. Oh. And so on. I can always find a really, really complicated curve that goes around every point and gets the puts all the triangles and the circles on one side. But do you really want that? The, at some point, you will say that you know you're kind of really remembering all the training data and just remembering only the training data. So the other extreme is a linear classifier, the line B which just separates the data with a line and does not make any commitments about these weird wiggles. Uh, the intuition here is for you to think about overfitting. The curve uh, A runs the risk of overfitting, whereas the uh, line B runs the opposite risk, which we have not given a name yet, but uh, it tends to be more uh, stable then than the curve. Because if you are allowing your learning algorithm to pick among all possible curves, then the more data you get, the more vaguely your curves will get. And there's no regularity that you are trying to uh, get out of the data. You can apply a similar argument for regression also. Remember, regression is the problem of predicting a real number. I could have a curve A that goes through every example. So the, in this case, our goal is given a, an, a, an input point X, we need to predict some real number. And I could have a curve A that goes through every point here, or I could have a line that sort of uh, ignores the, uh, the wiggliness. And you can make the same sort of argument. The line might be preferable because the curve is trying to fit all the noise in the data. Maybe if this point here was here only because of noise and it must have been somewhere here, then the curve would have gone something like this. So you are allowing the data to dictate your model a little too much. This is analogous to allowing your decision tree to fit the data perfectly. It's fitting the noise in the data. If you insist that your learner should produce a curve that perfectly fits your data, then you're guaranteeing that it fits the noise in the data. Did you have a question? Just like a thought. So like looking at regression, you're going over sort of the average between sort of. I mean, uh, I just drew the line, but yes. Right. So the the options we have are either an n-dimensional line that fits every single point, or something you're generalizing the process. Is there ever a point where you want to do n minus some number of dimension? So if you sort of want to get closer to your data. Yeah. That that's all. That's definitely the case. Linear is just one assumption, right? You could have a degree two polynomial, for example, which uh, might go a little bit more like this, or a degree three polynomial, which could go something like this. So th this is an assumption, a modeling assumption that you need to make. Um, and you know, the, how do you know how to make that assumption? Well, you just try it out and use cross-validation. 
always you think about cross validation any assumption can be uh, should not be made just because it's convenient but you have to think of a way of verifying the assumption so cross validation is a useful tool we haven't discussed cross validation in class yet but your homework makes you do it and at some point later on we'll discuss it in a little bit more detail by which point you would all be experts on cross validation because you'd have done it like a few times so just to kind of remind you there's a difference between classification and regression classification is when you predict discrete outputs a binary classifier predicts uh, two things regression is about predicting real numbers okay so let me let me give you an example of a linear classifier imagine that uh, you have a robot arm and we need to decide whether the arm is defective or not and we're going to use two measurements one of them is how far the arm can reach and i'll call that d so something like if it can reach a certain distance or not the other one is the maximum angle it can rotate and i'll call that a now imagine through some careful experimentation you found that uh, uh, the the arm is defective if 2d plus 0.01a is more than 7. don't ask me where these numbers came from i would say a learning algorithm but the real answer is i just start i just type them on the slide um it's just an example right so what i have here is a linear decision rule the two features in this problem are a and d and they interact with the decision uh, in a, through a linear function and now when i have a new robot arm or a new situation um, I can I can measure this these values of D and A. So D could be three and A could be two hundred. I could compute the value of two D plus point zero one A, and it's um, I think I made a mistake here. This is not not defective. It's defective. So it's eight, which is greater greater than seven, which crosses our uh, threshold. So it, the, we mark the arm as defective. So what we have done here is we have uh, computed a certain score and compared it against the threshold and if the threshold is crossed then we predict one label otherwise we predict the other label. this is just an intuition for uh, this uh, linear classifier um, the features in this case a and b are assigned weights point a is assigned a weight of two b is assigned a weight of 0 0.01 the weighted features are added up and the sum is compared against some threshold and that's our decision rule this is just an intuition. This is um, things are going to get more complicated very quickly. Let me generalize this to, uh, to the general case. Suppose you have d dimensional feature vectors denoted by x. So x is a vector with d elements in it. So this is your instance space. Your instance space consists of d-dimensional features. At this point, I'm assuming that uh, your feature extraction is done. And all the x's are real numbers. So each of these is a real number. And your labels can be a minus one or a plus one. By convention, we'll just, for this part of the class, we'll assume that we have labels that are minus one and plus one. I'm going to define something called a linear threshold unit. A linear threshold unit is something whose name is more complicated than what it is. Uh, all it does is, given an example x, we have a set of parameters w. In our previous example, w was uh, 2 and 0 0.01, and x was uh, a and b. You, uh, there's, and there's a real number b, you know, you know, which, are, which in our example was the number 7. Or actually, in this case, let's make it minus seven. In our example, it was minus seven. So, uh, what you do is given an example, we, the linear threshold unit, it contains parameters uh, w and v, and you take the dot product of w and x. So, this is simply the same as this expression here. You multiply every feature with its corresponding weight and you add them up. That's the dot product. And then you add this term called v. And you look at the sign of that number. If that number is positive, you say plus. If the number is negative, you say minus one. So, in other words, if W transpose X plus B, if W dot X plus B is more than zero, then you predict plus one. Otherwise, you predict minus one. The term B here is called the bias term. 
uh, and we this is the simplest case when we talk about neural networks we'll talk about bias it's exactly the same thing questions about uh, this definition of a linear threshold unit all i have done here is to define a certain operation i've not told you how to learn it i've not told you why this is interesting all i did here was to define yes Good question. How do you select the bias? Equivalently, good question. How do you select the weight? The double right? So both the weights and the bias are together the uh, the parameters that define the linear threshold unit, and it's the job of the learning algorithm to produce both of them for us. The learning algorithm will take a data set and do something to it and get you a bias and uh, the uh, the weight side i usually call the w the weights and then the the we have a classifier one of the nice things about a linear classifier is that it has a neat geometric interpretation i'm going to illustrate the geometry of the linear classifier using just two dimensions uh, imagine you have two features x1 and x2 in this case a linear classifier is going to look something like sine of w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus bias. This thing here, w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b, without the sign, is not well. Uh, before we do that, let's say that we have some data. We may have some data where you have positive and negative examples like this. And um, your linear classifier might be an expression sine of b plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2. Mathematically, this is the equation of a line. This thing here is the equation of a line. So in particular, W1 X1 plus W2 X2 plus B equals zero is a particular line in this two-dimensional space. And the sign of it is saying, are you on this side or on the other side? So the, uh, and as a notation, I like to draw this arrow to point to the positive side. It's the normal to this line here. Uh, the no the Going back to whenever, I don't know, third grade or something, when you see this sort of geometry, um, the normal to this uh, line is just a vector in two dimensions, uh, which is uh, the, the vector W1 and W2. So just as a minor detail, we only care about the sign of B plus W1, X1 plus B, uh, W2, X2. If instead of W1 and W2 and B, I had, 100B plus 100W1 plus 100W2. And I take the sign of that. The sign doesn't change. We only care about the magnitude of it and not the actual value of this number here. Um, in two dimensions, the linear classifier is essentially a line that slices the plane into two parts, positive and negative. In three dimensions, the linear classifier is a plane. Imagine in three dimensions, we are in this room and there's a plane that cuts this room into two. One side is plus, the other side is minus. In four dimensions and five and D dimensions, this object is called a hyperplane. Uh, in general, whenever we put the hyper in front, the word high, the, the prefix hyper in front is for higher dimensional. So we get hyperplanes, hypercubes, and such things. So the a linear classifier in higher dimensions is a hyperplane which essentially slices the space into two parts. And conveniently, we have two labels. So we assign one label to one side and the other label to the other side. Any questions about the geometry of linear classifiers? The, 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 I find this to be a sort of an intuitive thing because it allows me to think of data points as points in some space. And then I can think about what is the surface that separates uh, one label from another. Any questions? Yes. Uh, that's a, so the question was, does this extend, extend to the case when we have more than two labels? And the answer is, there is a natural extension to this. But it is, on one hand, it's natural. But on the other hand, it was, it took a little bit of research effort to kind of show that it's natural. Um, it's what you are asking about is a problem is is there a linear classifier 
for multi-class classification? And the answer is there is. And uh, I hope to do a lecture on multi-class classification at the end of the semester. And when that comes, we can come back to that. Um, if not, you can ask me uh, and I can point you to the, the appropriate lectures. But there is a natural extension. The geometry does not look exactly the same though. And if you want kind of a uh, annoying geometric puzzle, uh, think about it. So we have a minute left. And uh, now the next thing on my agenda is uh, to talk about a little bit of notation. And it tends to be tedious. And I'd rather do that at the beginning of the next lecture because uh, um, it will give you some chance to digest this material that you've seen. So let's stop now. Um, and uh, don't forget the homework. I'll have office hours at two o'clock. And if you have any questions, feel free to come to office hours.